coffee filter is kind of awesome. You know, if you drop them, they, they do this. And we can model the motion of this. And this is what we want to do. We want to model the motion of this falling coffee filter. And we got a bunch of stuff to do, so let's just get to it. Number one, air resistance. So you have an idea about air resistance because you've probably stuck your hand out of a car window. This is my dog, and the dog is not riding with the face off the window, but they do that sometimes, but this is not that. But I was trying to, I didn't have a picture of a hand, so I like to use my own picture. So they do like to stick their heads out, but I don't really let them do that. But that has nothing to do with physics. If you stick your hand out of the window while it's moving, you know that, that the faster the car goes, the, the more that air pushes against your hand. If you change the size of your hand, it, it changes that force too. So it's a backwards pushing force. It depends on the speed. Uh, it depends on the size of the object. It depends on the, dense, uh, the shape of the object. So a flat disc versus a ball would be different. Uh, it depends on the density of air, which we never change anyway. And so one way we can model this, and there's more than one way to model it, but this is the model that I want to use today. It says that the air resistance is equal to this equation. Uh, so we have here, that's the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity squared. Now, for a falling coffee filter, it might be a better model to use. It's proportional to the velocity, but I'm doing it this way and you can't stop me and I'm not going to change because it's too late. It depends on the size of the object. That's it. That's a cross-sectional area, right? So that just depends on how, how big it looks from the direction that it's moving. It's not the actual surface area. Uh, that's A. And then the shape of the object is a drag coefficient, capital C. So a sphere and a disk would be different. And then rho is the density of air. Um, <clears throat> in normal conditions, air is about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Although if you go up higher in the atmosphere, it does indeed change. So let's go back to a falling coffee filter. So here's my falling coffee filter right when I let go, and that's barely on the picture. I almost cut it off. Sorry about that. So right when I let go, it's not moving. So it has a velocity of zero. There is, there is a vector over that. I don't know if you can see that. See, I did say beat zero vector. Uh, so that means there's no air resistance force with the zero velocity. The only force on it is the downward gravitational force. That means it's going to increase in speed that way, right? So a little bit later, it's moving like this. It's moving a little bit faster. And so it has a non-zero velocity. I just, picked a, I just picked a value. But that means there's going to be an upwards pushing air resistance force. The air resistance is in the opposite direction of motion. This means that it's not going to fall with the same acceleration. It's going to have a lower acceleration because those two forces are in opposite directions. And eventually it'll get down to some point right here where the air resistance force is equal to the gravitational force. And we add those two things together and uh, we call this terminal velocity. And see, I even put that right there in big yellow uh, and black letters, terminal velocity. So when that coffee filter falls, it reaches the point where the, where the air resistance force and the weight are the same. And then the net force is zero and no longer accelerates anymore. So let's use terminal velocity to investigate properties of the falling coffee filter. So here's a coffee filter at terminal velocity. I have this as my air resistance. I'm, I'm switching to one dimensional motion just to make things easier. So this is the, air, the magnitude of the air resistance force. Now, we have some properties here rho, the density of air, the size of, I'm going to drop a coffee filter, the shape of a coffee filter and the size don't change, the density of air doesn't change, just the velocity. So I can group all of this stuff, one half rho AC, it doesn't change. So just to make it simpler, I'm going to call it lowercase c, that's all my uh, drag parameters right there. Now let's look at the, uh, the acceleration in the y direction at terminal velocity. At terminal velocity, the acceleration is zero. So the mass times acceleration is zero, and uh, I can write that as the air resistance force minus the gravitational force. Let's put in our expression for the air resistance, CVT squared, terminal velocity squared, right? That's the terminal velocity, and that has to be equal to zero. So I get the following equation, CVT squared is equal to mg. It's an important equation, right? because now I could change the mass of the coffee filter, and you can do that by stacking coffee filters, that's what makes them so nice, and I'm gonna get a new terminal velocity. So I have this relationship between terminal velocity and mass, and I can use that to determine the coefficient right there, the drag coefficient, I'm calling it the drag coefficient, but it's not actually. 
It's the drag parameter, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so how do we get the terminal velocity of a falling coffee filter? What I did was to take a filter and drop it over a motion detector. And I'm not going to do all that data for you, um, but it's not too difficult to see. So if you drop it, the coffee filter is falling on it. During this part right here, the coffee filter is accelerating, and it's a kind of a parabolic fit. Here I was just holding it. Uh, and then it, down here, it reaches some part where it looks like it's moving at a constant velocity. This is position versus time. So the slope of a position versus time graph is the, acceler is the velocity, the vertical velocity. So all I have to do is fit a linear fit equation to that. It gives me a slope. I get the terminal velocity. Yay. And then right here, it hit the ground, and then it detected something. It detected the ceiling or something. It missed the detector, and it detected the ceiling. That's, that's probably what that is. Look, three meters. Yeah, probably what that is. Okay, so we can do that for different masses of coffee filters and measure the terminal velocity. Here is what I get. This is my data. First of all, I have the mass of one coffee filter. I took eight coffee filters. I found the mass, and then I divided by eight to get the mass of one. I dropped eight coffee filters. I got a terminal velocity, and then I squared that terminal velocity, and then I did seven, and then I got the mass velocity, terminal velocity squared it, and so forth, and I get all this data. Okay, so remember, the terminal velocity squared is proportional to the mass, so I can plot terminal velocity versus squared versus mass, and that's what I did. So here's my plot of terminal velocity versus mass, and again, my little thing's off, put that over there. There we go, okay. So this is uh, terminal velocity squared versus the mass in kilograms. Uh, you'll see it's a fairly good fit, not perfect, uh, but fairly good fit, and let's see, what did I do? Oh, yeah. So I have, uh, there's my equation, C, V, T squared. Sh it should be capital T. V, T squared is M, G. Uh, and then if I solve that for V, T squared, I get G over C times M. And this is important, right? Because now it's in the equation of a line. Now, this is my vertical variable, and this is my horizontal variable. So this is like Y equals m c m x plus b b is zero and that is my slope so that's kind of nice right so here this is my slope you can see it right here 980.9 i left off the units just to make sure that I have enough space and i'm going to set the slope equal to that g over c i can then solve that for c and i get 0 0.01 newton second squared per kilogram squared and that's not the best unit, but it makes sense, right? Because right up here, this is in newtons. This is in meters squared per second squared. So this would have to be in newtons second squared per meter squared. Uh, you can also get that from the slope up here. I put my units in the slope. So it gives me meter squared per second squared per kilogram. And you can get, and then if I divide that by, if I take newtons per kilogram divided by that, you get the same thing, so. But it's not, it's not a super big deal. But now I have my drag coefficient. I have my parameter. That's important. Now let's go back and drop uh, a coffee filter. Here's a dropped coffee filter, and this is the data for the coffee filter as it falls. And this is an 11.51 gram stack of filters. What I want to do is, that's real data. Can I model the motion of a coffee filter and get that same data? That's what I want. Can I reproduce this with a model? If I can do that, that's a win. So how do we do that? Here, oh, I messed that up. Here's my coffee filter uh, at any particular point. It doesn't have to be terminal velocity. Remember that the net force is mass times acceleration, and I have the CV squared, not terminal velocity, right? Because this could be anything. The, the, Air resistance could be for any velocity. I want to do for any velocity. Minus the weight, mg, and that's going to be the mass times acceleration. And the problem here is that the acceleration changes the velocity, but the, the acceleration depends on the velocity. So that makes it a complicated problem uh, from an introductory physics uh, viewpoint. And how can we deal with that? We can't use the kinematic equations. Those assume the acceleration is constant. Well, let's do this. Let's solve for the acceleration. I'm going to solve for the acceleration. And uh, it's just taking that equation. I'm going to divide both sides by m. I'm also going to drop the sub y. And I don't have y's in here. I'm just dealing with one dimension. That's just to make it easier. It's not right. 
It's not the right thing to do. It's just the easy thing to do. So now I want to break the problem into short time intervals. So let's, let's imagine that I have a coffee filter at time T1 right here. Okay. And it's moving down. It has some velocity V1. And it sets some position Y1. And then a little bit later, after 0.01 seconds, delta T of 0.01 seconds, it's right here. So now it has a new time, T2. It has a new position, Y2, and a new, posi a new velocity, V2. And we want to find uh, how to get this stuff from this stuff and that. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so let's start with the definition of acceleration in one dimension. It's the change in velocity with respect to time. And, and see, we're doing it as an interval, right? We have that delta t. I can write the change in velocity as v2 minus v1. That's change, change in velocity. Now, if I just multiply both sides of the equation by delta t and add v1, I get this. This is the same equation as this, right? v2 is v1 plus a delta t. Multiply by delta t, add v1, you get that. That's an important equation. Now I can use uh, the following definition for the average velocity during that time interval. Average, this is the average velocity. Change in y over change in t. And again, it's y2 minus y1 over delta t. I can solve that for y2, multiply by delta t, add one. And, and I did something here, I made a little trick. I said y2 is y1 plus v2 delta t. Cheating alert number one, I cheated right? I cheated. I cheated twice, really. I cheated up here because I said the acceleration was constant, and it's not constant, right? We just said it changes. But during 0.01 seconds, it didn't change that much, right? It's fine. It's fine. It'd be fine. And then down here, I made the, I made the cheat too. I said that the average velocity, which is true, is y2 minus y1 over delta t. And i put v2, I didn't put the average velocity, I put the velocity at the end of the time interval instead of the average. But again, I mean, does the velocity really change that much during the time interval? So here's what we're going to do. Calculate the acceleration, right? And I can do that. C v squared over m minus g. Use that to update the velocity. So I can go from, if I have v1, if I know the initial velocity, I can find v2. If I if I know v2, I can find v3. Use v2 to update the position. And then I'm going to use, then I'm going to update time. Then I'm going to move to from t1 to t2. I'm done. Now I just need to do that whole thing again. So I can, if I want to get a whole second of motion of a falling coffee filter, I'll need to do these things a hundred times, right? Because my time step of 0.01. .01. We are ready to go. Let's jump to Python and let's just do this. Okay, I actually already started a tiny little bit. Uh, I will give you the code. Uh, this, I'm going to run it for you just so you can see. So this is the data uh, from the actual drop. So I already have that in there. And it's all this stuff down here, but you don't need to worry about that. I've already made a graph. So I have G1 as a graph. It's got my uh, titles, my axis, my labels. And this is my, my stuff to plot. The, the data that I have. Let's make another plot. I'm going to call it F1. It's G curve color equals color dot blue. And that's fine. And then here I have my initial Y position. One of the things you're going to notice in Python is we don't use units, right? Units are the human's job. Uh, so I just have the initial position and that's from the video. I want to match it up. I have G, my gravitational field. This is a little bit bigger. Let's make that a little bit bigger. I like big. Um, and then there's the mass, 11.51 grams. I converted to kilograms. There's my initial time. There's my initial time step. I do need one more thing. I need my drag coefficient C. I said it was 0 0.01. That's the one I used. Okay. I do need one other thing, right? If I'm going to update the velocity, I need the starting velocity. So let's start with that too. V equals zero. So I think I'm pretty much set. Now, what I want to do is to, let me run this one more time. Notice that I this goes for uh, 7.66 seconds. So let's do the same thing. Let's run this for 7.66 seconds. So I'm going to do that with a while loop. While I need dt. I got that. While t is less than 0 0.766. 
So this is a great way to repeat all those loops, right? I'm going to repeat all those loops by doing a while loop. I'm going to do this as long as t is less than that value. So I need to make sure that I update t, t equals t plus dt. Let's move this up a little bit. Or I will make a mistake. If you leave that off, if you leave off t equals t plus dt, your, your program is going to run forever and you'll never stop and then you'll be, you will, you'll never be able to use your computer again because it just keeps on running this program. I'm kidding. But you do need to kill it. Uh, so let's, the first thing I want to do is to calculate the force. And you don't, well, I, I wrote it as A. So let's just calculate A. A equals C times V squared divided by M. In Python, squared is star star. Okay. And, and all, I have values for all these things, right? V is zero. That's fine. And then minus G. And G I'm using as 9.8, but, but we have it as downward. So that's the way we do it. So I have my acceleration. Now what do I need to do? I need to use that to update my velocity. V equals V plus A times DT. That's it. Now you'll notice here if you're not, if you haven't done Python before, this is not an algebraic equation. If it was, the V's would cancel. This says take the value of V, add this stuff to it, and make it the new V. This is V2 equals V1 plus A delta T. This is V3 equals V2 plus V A delta T. So we just keep on updating it. We don't have to keep track of all those numbers. Now I'm going to update Y. Y equals Y plus V times DT. And you will notice that since I did this after I did this, I'm actually using V2. Right? I'm using the velocity at the end of the time interval because of the order I'm doing things. You can change up the order, but this order gives you the most accurate value. Uh, and then I update the time. That's it. Now, I'm going to go ahead and plot those points. F1.plot. Uh, my, 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 my horizontal variable is going to be T. My vertical variable is Y. And we're done. Let's see what kind of damage we did. It may not be perfect because I don't know what I'm, I just did it this live. Oh, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> okay, so my graph's a little bit too big. Let me make that a little bit smaller. Graph width is, let's do it as 400 by 200 and run it there. That's pretty good. I mean, that's pretty good. You'll notice that I have a slightly different terminal velocity. That's fine. Um, but still, it's pretty good. Uh, I could I could get a better value for my my drag coefficient. Um, I had actually 0 0.00999. Let's just try that. I rounded. Let's put 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's see if that makes a big difference. That didn't really make that big of a difference. But still, I mean, this is a really good thing, right? This is modeling motion that's not trivial. But this program, what is this doing? is not that complicated, right? I have my constants right there. I have this loop. That's it. That's all I did. All the other stuff was just plotting the data I already had. Okay. So just as an incentive, you could technically use this to do more complicated calculations. You could take like a ping pong ball and throw it, and you could do it in two dimensions, which you have to deal with vectors, and it's a little bit more difficult, but it's pretty awesome. Um, you could even do something like falling from space, an object falling from space where the density of air changes as well as the speed. And yes, now you have to build a model for the density of air. A little bit more difficult, but still the same idea. So it's a very, very, very powerful idea. Uh, numerical calculations, and then we're using it with real data. So that's it. If you made it to the end, good job. Uh, I'll post a link to this code down below. You can play with it whatever you like, and that's that. Talk to you later.